OK. So let me start with this image here. This is going to be my friend, the octopus. It's going to have some coffee. While it's going to be exposed to a very complex environment, this environment is going to be several machines in a casino. So my friend has to take difficult decisions. He's going to take some actions. And for, that, for every action that he's going to take, he's going to get some type of reward. What kind, what kind of actions uh, must take my friend? Uh, for example, must choose what machine play and for how much time must be played. Also need to take decisions like what to maximize in this game, should maximize the expected value or expected growth. It's also a very difficult decision. And also type of decisions related to risk, like it's possible to manage my liquidity risk or I'm going to be exposed to funding risk. Uh, it's possible to use common models like Markowitz model or the Black Determinant model to try to build a portfolio that makes sense. There are like too many difficult decisions to take here, and I'm going to call this problem a dynamic programming problem, and it's going to be our first uh, thing to think about. <clears throat> now, let me show you a complete different situation. It's going to be also an agent, but the environment is going to be completely different. In this case, the environment is going to be little pieces of comic books of Tintin. And as you know, this environment is a little bit more abstract, maybe a little bit more human. And our agent is going to give us like some outputs, uh, like this one I have put here down. It's going to be a sentence. And if you take some time reading it and analyzing what the sentence is saying, it looks like this agent it's like a, almost like a human in the way that it communicates. And not only that, it can express what, the, what is happening in the story. And even is giving us like a, a possible and realistic forecast about what the main character of the story is going to do. So we would say that this agent is, we cannot uh, differentiate this agent from a machine or from a human. And that is quite quite interesting, right? So this 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 problem I'm going to call it dynamic programming uh, two. And um, I wanted to show you these two examples, um, in order to make an important question. My question is: What do you think is the most difficult agent to be replicated? I mean, what is the most difficult agent to be coded or be programming to a machine? Um, and, and definitely the, the answer is going to be the second case because to try to replicate the human behavior is quite difficult. I would say that it's almost with the technology, the current technology is not, is not even possible. And our problem is, is to talk about ALM and not to talk about general intelligence. And that's why uh, I wanted to show you to these examples and to tell you that I'm not going to use the words of artificial intelligence in all the presentation. I'm going to talk only about machine learning because it's the only thing that can be implemented and is going to be a narrow space or a narrow scope that definitely we can tackle. Anyway, machine learning is, is just not one thing. Machine learning is a compendium. Uh, it's going to be an aggregation of many, many things like decision theory, statistics, game of theory, control theory, Markov decision processes, dynamic programming, discrete mathematics, probabilistics, even philosophy of science, a theory of computation. And many of these areas have been with us like for many, many years. And I wouldn't say that a lot of them are new. A lot of them has been with us like for almost like 50 or even 100 years. And why we are talking about machine learning so much nowadays, if those ideas have been with us for many years? And the, and the explanation for that is because of computers. The computers that we are having right now are more powerful. We have these nice and beautiful cloud machines with our clusters that we can uh, take advantage of. So that's why I wanted to show you that this is not just one discipline. And in order to, to talk about machine learning applied in ALM and in finance in general, 
for me, it's important to communicate what is the meaning of learning and what is the meaning of reasoning for a machine. Um, because it can, it can be confu confusing if I go directly to the applications. And I don't, I don't tell you the downside of this technology, because there are some downsides and upsides, and we need to be careful uh, and don't fall in the trap of this new way without understanding a little bit about it, okay? So I'm going to go to the beginning of the beginning with this sentence from Bertrand Russell. It's very, very interesting uh, sentence. And what he's trying to communicate is the classic induction problem. And this induction problem, what it states is that if you show a machine or if you show an agent the same situation again and again and again with historical data, that machine is not going to be capable of extrapolate something useful. And in this case, this poor chicken has been shown again and again the same data and one day uh, ended in the kitchen and, be, and cooked. So th this is the idea, right? This is the induction problem. So what is, what is the meaning of reasoning? Reasoning had, can be categorized uh, at least in three groups. This is a very old philosophical thing. And um, the last column, I'm going to start with the last column and it's going to be the abduction reasoning. The abduction reasoning, I would say, is going to be reserved only for the humans. It's this amazing capacity that we have to uh, create experiments in our heads and play with hypotheses and make conclusions like in a very playful way. But machines, machines cannot do that because machines don't understand the reality. Machines can only think in the deductive and inductive way. Those are the two columns I have uh, put here in the middle of this slide. And the deductive reason is, is a very top-down mechanical way of thinking. And it's going from something general to something specific. It's just like following a recipe, all right? And the inductive way of thinking, this is the where the magic comes from when we are talking about machine learning, is because the inductive is something more, um, maybe it requires some uncertainty. And it also requires some partial knowledge about the reality. The inductive reasoning is, is about going from something specific to something general. It's like to generalize something from something that we have seen and it's to start from facts and try to infer a rule. It's like, it's like the other way around from the deductive. And definitely machines, the deductive, they are like so good and so efficient with the deductive uh, reasoning. And sometimes they do inductive reasoning much better than us. Not always, but <clears throat> a lot of cases is going to be that the case. Anyway. I told you already the difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, and we are going to keep the idea that we are going to talk about only machine learning in the in a very narrow domain that's going to be the ALM domain and risk uh, management. Second, I told you about um, that machine learning is built on little pieces of many disciplines. And also I started telling you the difference between deductive and inductive. And I wanted to focus my strength and my skills only to tell you about the inductive, because the deductive is just like coding software or coding nor a, a normal software, but the inductive is a little bit more tricky, and this is the one that we need to focus on. Uh, machines need like food to use the inductive reasoning, and that food is the uh, raw data. And that raw data is going to be our input for our models. Um, in ALM, we have like a lot of type of information. I'll, and I have put here a list, a reduced list of the main type of information that we can find, like everything related to the, to the financial institution, everything related to the systematic or the environment of the financial institution, and also a lot of information that we have in our systems, especially in databases about our clients, right? Like the personal information, contract characteristics of the contracts, income, transactions made by the client, <clears throat> the history of the loans, the deposits, so much information. And this, uh, this info is what we're going to use for training our models. So, we have our inputs that uh, I discussed uh, very, very shortly. 
uh, with this diagram, I'm going to try to tell you uh, the process of induction. So, how I'm going to do this? Um, let's let's start with a very simple example. Let's imagine that we want to model the prepayment rate or the prepare the probability of prepayment. It's a very common problem in ALM. So we are going to put those variables on the right side of this diagram. I'm going to call them the target variable or the output of our machine. And on the left side of this diagram, I'm going to put all this input and all this raw data I've been talking to you. And in the middle of this diagram, like these two pieces here in the middle, are going to be the key part of the induction uh, reasoning. So the induction reasoning is going to be composed of three things. One of them is going to be the transformations made to the inputs, then also the parameters of a model and also a, a model. Because we want, we want to train something, when we are talking is about training a model. And to train a model uh, means to optimize or to maximize something. So that model is going to be representative of the reality that tries to describe. Basically, the inductive uh, reasoning is about mapping input with an output. That means to find the hidden mechanism that we cannot see but a machine can see, and that uh, mechanism is going to be a little description of the reality. Obviously, it's not going to be perfect because we are going to have some risk when we are sampling the inputs. When we are sampling the input, the inputs from a population, unfortunately, those inputs is going to be limited, limited in information. All right, so that's why when we try a model, we're going to have this risk of the model not uh, generalizing correctly or not uh, learning the, the full story. This uh, induction process is quite difficult to do in financial, with financial data. Um, it's very common to see data scientists that come from other areas and try to apply these ideas to the financial data and it doesn't work. It doesn't work because uh, we have some problems with data when we are talking about finance. The first of all is going to be the non-stationarity. We know that there is almost no market data where the distribution is stationary. And that's a big thing because that makes it so difficult to make the inference process. Um, there is another problem that I haven't listed here and I, I think is also very important. And this when we are talking about risk, we are talking about the fat tails of the distributions and when the distributions have a lot of fat tails, unfortunately, it's very difficult to infer um, the estimators of the moment one, moment two of those distributions because they don't converge, right? There is no convergence of these, of these uh, values. That makes also very difficult the, the inductive process. And also there is a lot of data that maybe is not in our databases good quality, maybe good uh, exogenous information, but if it is, is not in our hands, we cannot use it, uh, it's not going to work. Um, so there are like a lot of problems that uh, also can be very interesting, like the high dimensionality. High dimensionality is that sometimes we, we have a lot of factors, a lot of uh, features or possible or potential predictors, but uh, some of these predictors doesn't have enough information, so it's like also like a big deal. So let me summarize again what I have been telling you. Uh, first, the difference between uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Second, the difference between deductive and inductive, and that we are going to keep into the inductive world. Uh, three, I show you a diagram to tell you about the process of the inductive process. Um, the last thing I show you is uh, why it's so difficult to implement in finance. And now we're going, what I try to do now, I'm going to tell you the recipe to try to train a model. It's, it's a recipe and in the last part of this session, what I'm going to do is to code a little bit with you and show you in practice uh, how to follow this recipe, okay? So the recipe has like several steps. The first step is go to the reality, is go outside and measure the reality. So let's get some data, X and Y. 
Uh, of course, here is going to be a big risk because you can get some bias on those data if you don't do it correctly. The second step is to think that there is a relationship between the X and the Y. That's an important one. And also what we are going to do is to choose a possible models or legal models that can be useful. For example, a neural nets, a linear functions, polynomials, anything that you can imagine. And I'm going to call this set of functions, the hypothesis space is going to be cho chosen by us as humans. And then in order to optimize uh, something, we need to find a function to optimize. Of course, in this case, it's going to be the loss function. The loss function is basically the error of prediction. And what we want to minimize is that error of prediction. So our model is going to throw us some results. And what we need to do is to uh, measure how far is that a uh, result from the reality. And that's going to be with a loss function, okay? And then also there is a very important ingredient here in this recipe, and it's about the optimization, optimization algorithm. The optimization algorithm is going to be like the flashlight for the machine to move in that big uh, hypothesis space of different parameters. So if, if a model is given, the, the machine has to move in this uh, big field of parameters and calculate the loss function. And the idea is to find uh, the combination of parameters where the, that loss function is minimum. This is, this is about optimization. And this optimization process, the, the result is about taking a decision. And that decision is going to be the model that uh, has a certain parameters. And when we get those parameters and those values, we will say that, is, that we have inferred a realistic model, all right? Obviously, it's possible that our machine is going to give us not only one model, it could throw us, unfortunately, two, three, or five models. And we, as humans, we need to have a criteria to choose which of the hypotheses do we, we think that is the best one. And I think this part is like a key part because uh, to choose hypotheses, this is like a very old problem in, in philosophy. And what scientists have been doing is to apply something called the Occam's razor. The Occam's razor, what it states is that if you have two hypotheses that represent or describe the reality with the same accuracy or equally well, what you should do is to take that a uh, hypothesis that is the simplest one. And this is like a so beautiful idea, right? Uh, we can express this in a mathematical expression or mathematical uh, formula, or uh, I don't know how to call it exactly, but it's the, the Aikiki information criteria, the Bayesian information criteria. This type of uh, measurements are going to help us to implement the Occam's razor in, in a number, all right? This, this in, in a statistical, uh, in statistical words, what he's trying to do is to, I don't know if you remember the meaning of a maximum likelihood, but what, what these two criteria are trying to do is to maximize the maximization, is to maximize the likelihood of the, of the model and also to uh, penalize the complexity of the model. I wanted to show you like some examples of the losses that we can implement. Maybe this is not so important, but uh, what I want to, you to keep in mind is that there are many ways to define the loss, the error function, and it's going to depend on the problem that we are going to tackle, but you should choose one over the another one. Most of the time, the difference is going to be if, you're one, if you want to categorize something or you want just to uh, find a regression model. <clears throat> so there, I, I've been talking, I've been, I've been, calling the process of learning like like a recipe and um, i can i can make a, a small analogy about cooking right the first time i tried to cook the famous recipe of my mom uh, the lasagnas this amazing lasagna that she liked to cook sometimes the first time i tried to cook it it didn't work very well what a disaster 
even though I follow this recipe so carefully. I follow every step, but, but in the end, it didn't work. And at that moment, I was like uh, a little bit sad. I didn't understand why until I read a paper, a very famous paper of someone called, um, it's a very famous researcher, Tom M. Mitchell, and the paper is called um, The Need of Bias for Generalization of Learning. And what it's trying to say this paper is that bias is very important. And I want to tell you why is bias is very important. And bias a little bit is like cholesterol. There is like the good one and the bad one. Normal, normally, when you when you read the famous uh, blogs about machine learning, people say that bias is bad. But definitely, bias is not always bad. Bias sometimes is necessary to make the famous leap of induction. And I want to tell you why. There is a very famous trade-off between bias and variance. And bias happens when your model is too simple. When the model is too simple, what is going to happen is that the model is going to miss all the time. And when the model is too complex, when the machine has too much freedom to choose between a lot of models and a lot of parameters, what is going to happen is that the machine is going to memorize and in sample is going to do a perfect job. But when you show the machine a, in production a data out of sample, it's going to be disaster. Okay. And there is this a balance, this trade off between complexity and simplicity. And the decision is going to be a, related to the experience that you have. Uh, with machine learning. So we need to focus our strength and our knowledge about taking a decision of what we want to resolve to reduce the bias and the variance. And that is going to depend a lot about the problem, about the reality that we are handling with. Why, uh, when I read the paper, let me come back to the problem of the recipe of my lasagna. When I read the paper, I realized, I mean, I had like, I had like this aha moment that I didn't do it well because there is a lot of experience that my parents and my mom had a, while cooking for, for years. And that experience built a, like a parallel universe in her head about what is good and what is bad. Uh, it has built like some heuristics in her head that she can apply easily to to any type of dish, right? And when I cooked that lasagna, I didn't have like I, I didn't have that that experience. And that experience, when we talk about machine learning, can be expressed in terms of bias. That's why what we call about bias is good sometimes, is because bias is going to be the key component to 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 do the inference from something that the algorithm has been seen for in the history in sample, and you're going to make the leap for the out sample, all right? So the bias is going to be so necessary to, to cook these, these models. So I've been I have been telling you about maximization of the likelihood. Maximization of the likelihood is a, a very common thing in statistics, and it's about a, fixing the model. It's about giving a model try to calculate the probability to generate the data that you see in the reality with that model, all right? So it's about how much similar is the data genera generated by the model with the reality that we have seen, what that we are observing. And we are going to keep the model that does that job better. That way of, of, a, that way of seeing the world of, of learning is what is called the frequentist approach. Some people call it the classical approach. And there is a different way of seeing the things, is the other way around. And it's to think that uh, <clears throat> the uncertainty is not coming from the sampling process. The uncertainty is not coming from the data. The data is what we have. So why don't we fix the data and try to calculate the probability of a model? given the data. This is like 
a little bit like strange. It's, it sounds like strange because how is possible that there is uncertainty in the model, but it makes sense if you think that sometimes, most of the times, we don't understand the apparatus, the mechanism about our reality, and that's why we say that there is some type of uncertainty. And this uncertainty is about our ignorance. And this ignorance, we can uh, try to translate in how, how the parameters can be a model like a distribution. It means we can say that there is uncertainty in the model or in the parameters, and we can think that there is like a distribution about these parameters. And how to do that? The only way to do this is to is to work next to someone that really understands their reality, someone that really is an expert of the domain and can help us to define <clears throat> this distribution of the parameters. And what we are going to do is to try to maximize the posteriori or the the this distribution of the of the parameter given the data. All right. <clears throat> So most of the time when you read papers in the internet, what you're going to find out is that most of the papers are going to be about frequencies to apply to, apply to machine learning. But in finance, we have few data and the frequencies works very well when you have a lot of data, <clears throat> but, when, but when you have few data, you have to be creative. You have to use the creativity. And the creativity <clears throat> can become in the form of the Bayesian approach. It's not, done, it's not I'm not saying that it's the best way to to approach a problem always, only sometimes it's going to be a very useful tool. And I wanted to tell you that <clears throat> uh, unfortunately it's not a very common tool that you're going to see in examples uh, in blogs um, <clears throat> in other, other uh, sources of machine learning. So I wanted you to tell you only this, that you have this resource and you have to investigate how to use it, of course. There are many differences between the Bayesian and the frequentist. Uh, the Bayesian, the Bayesian, in the end, is a little bit easier to understand, but <clears throat> it also is more difficult to implement. And you're going to need someone that understands perfectly the the domain. And the frequencies is maybe a little bit more, um, maybe a little bit less intuitive because we are talking about this confidence level, and the the concept of confidence level is not is not very easy to understand. But we, I would say, this is a little bit uh, faster to implement and maybe a little bit more objective, okay? So <clears throat> let me go with the applicabilities of everything I have been telling you to ALM. What type of problems are we, are we facing when we are talking about ALM? <clears throat> there are like three major components of problems. One of them is related to the idiosyncratic information. Is everything that is a, a outside of the financial institution, like everything related to the markets. It could be interest rates or it could be GDP and other type of data. The other big part is the new business or new production and is a, how much new, new, new volume or new clients are coming to the financial institution, and obviously, uh, this is a very big deal. It's going to depend a lot about idiosyncratic variables, about uh, campaigns and decisions uh, that the the strategy decisions that the same financial institution is going to take. And there is a last one. It's going to be the most difficult one. Is the behavioral one? Is the most difficult and also maybe the most interesting for a lot of people, because we are talking about uh, something subjective about our clients. And um, is everything with that we ha that has optionality, like the prepayments, the non-maturity deposits, and the default behavior. And here, maybe here's the, the difficult part. What are the? Let, let me tell you why we should use machine learning in in ALM. And in order to do that, I have to start with why uh, we have so, some problems with the current models. The first uh, problem that we are going to have with the current models is that sometimes they are too simple and don't capture the reality. Uh, sometimes the reality is more complex, like uh, nonlinearity and other type of complexities, 
and the current models maybe are not capable of capturing that reality, all right? The other very common problem is about the, the type of data that we have. We can find sometimes a, a lot of data, but it's not a structure and it's not going to be easy to be used. And the last of the problems maybe is a little bit of distrust about these new technologies. And it's, it's normal to, to be distressful about these new technologies because it's a, about this a black box thing. But I'm going to tell you that not all deep learning has to be black box and not all machine learning has to be black box. And I'm going to show you some examples about that. Why we shouldn't use machine learning? First, machines are very good trying to find a, um, patterns and they are very efficient trying to find patterns. Also, they are very good uh, um, to find hidden mechanisms of the reality uh, if you do it correctly. And they can be built for dynamic programming. That means that they can work almost like in real time. And there is like a connection between the environment and the machine. And if we do it correctly, we are going to have this, this mechanism of a dynamic communication. Also, there are like a lot of variables that sometimes we don't take into account. Um, when we have high dimensionality, we as humans, we are not going to be able to handle it very easily, um, but machines can do it. So it's just about how to use the, the technique. There are like three ways of using machine learning in general. There are maybe more, but at least the three is going to be the most important. The first one is trying to use machine learning for prediction. It's the, it's the most common to use prediction to uh, predict prices and predict uh, market uh, data, predict behavior of our clients. Uh, this is the part that it could be dangerous because when we are trying to predict, sometimes we focus too much on accuracy and it's very common to overfit. Uh, <clears throat> so this, this is a very interesting, interesting thing. But it's not the best. It's not the best way to apply these techniques. There are other two ways to apply these techniques. Uh, the second one in this in this slide is compression of information. What we can do is to use machine learning to compress some data, some uh, noisy data, and try to extract that information. Let's try to. In, in data scientists, we call it uh, to extract to extract the data latent space is to try to find this core uh, mechanism that we cannot see with our with our with our uh, skills as humans. And there is one last uh, way of using machine learning that is also very powerful, and it's when you have a lot of uh, possible predictors, a lot of possible variables that you want to include in your models. And what you can do is to apply this technique to filter and to only keep those variables that really is going to contribute with real information to our model. The first example that I'm going to tackle is going to be the client segmentation. In technical words, we can call it client clustering. And what it does is to try to use a one of the four techniques of clustering, the density, hierarchical, soft, and partitioning. Every of these techniques have some advantages and disadvantages. And what we're going to do is to clusterize uh, the data, clients, for example, or contracts. And we are going to use this type of model as a previous model to help other models that has been already implemented or are already in production to make a better prediction. Or we can just use this model to uh, find outliers and to take also some decisions about our, our clients. The difference between these four ways of uh, clustering is um, not only about how we measure the distance between uh, between two samples is also about a if we want a hierarchy a hierarchical uh, structure and, and we can take interesting um, interesting decisions if we have a hierarchical structure about our data and there is another type the density one that is going to help us to find outliers easily if our data are compact clouds of points 
it's going to be easy with this uh, technique to find the outliers that are not included in this clouds. The soft clustering is good when we need to when we need to have a uh, several uh, several uh, groups for one for one point. I mean, if we want that one point can be part of several clusters. And uh, the partitioning or the camis that is the most famous one. It's about finding a uh, centroids in in our space. <clears throat> also, I wanted to tell you about a a very common application of machine learning is is about prediction of the interest rates. Uh, I'm sure that you have a read uh, at least you have a read about. If you work in ALM, you're going to be familiar with it, uh, with the Nelson Siegel model. This model, what it does is to compress information in three factors, the shift, uh, the uh, curvature, and the slope. And then with that uh, compressed information, the Nelson Siegel model, we can apply a autoregressive operational, uh, autoregressive model, it's like an ARIMA, and we can try to predict. So we can do something similar, but with a, a different architecture, like the a recurrent neural net. This is a type of neural net, a type of deep learning, or we can use the LSTM, a, the long short term memory architecture. I'm going to use this architecture for the practice. And what it does is to try to keep the sequence of the data um, similar to the Nelson Siegel model. What we are going to do is to compress information with autoencoder, with this architecture, we are going to compress information. We are going to, with that information that is compressed, we are going to try to predict. And we can use endogenous and exogenous information. Endogenous information is just to use the interest rates. And exogenous information is try to use a information from the market that is not related to the interest rates. It could be, for example, spot forex or the inflation levels. This type of thing that we think that is going to be affect our prediction. Also, we can use interest rates from other countries because we know that inter European interest rates can be affected by American interest rates. Um, also, it's possible that the interest rates is going to be affected by the prices of, of houses and the employment rate. You know that uh, this is a very common, common thing. Other, other interesting problem in ALM is the, is the prepayment rate or the probability of prepayment. If we want to model a probability, we need to model a number between zero and one because it's a probability, right? Probability must be between zero and one. And this model that I'm showing you here that it seems like complex is not so complex if, if we try to divide it and try to explaining in little pieces. The first component of this model is the clustering, the thing that I already told you, that is to apply a clustering technique to try to have different groups of clients and customers. And then what we are going to do is to apply a filtering process, also another technique I have been telling you that is very nice because with the filtering process, what we can do in this case is the mean decrease in poverty. What we can do is to only keep those variables that we think that are going to give real information to the problem. And then we're going to apply a layer of transformation or normalization. And the last part is going to be a very simple neural net, a, almost the same like a logistic regression, if you pay attention, because it's four parameters and um, activation function is the sigma, the sigma function. So we are talking is basically a logistic regression, but in the form of a, of a neural net. The key part maybe in this problem is the partitioning and the filtering, because the logistic re regression is a very common technique and has been used for years. But here, the new thing is about the, the filtering and the partitioning. If, you, if, we can, if we can take a lot of information as inputs, pos, uh, possible information, 
and we apply the mean decrease in purity, this technique that is based on decision trees, we can filter uh, and keep those, para those uh, variables that we think that's going to be useful. Obviously, there are a lot of uh, information that we know from experience that are going to be important, like the spread between the client uh, rate and the interest rate, or the face value of the, of the loan, are variables that we know that are very important in this type of model. That's, I'm sure that our filtering process is, is going to help us keeping those variables. And also, if we if we want to be if we want to apply the Bayesian approach, we can do it here too because there are Bayesian logistic regression, and you can find it in some packages, very famous packages in machine learning. And here, this there is common a uh, difficulty because uh, when we try to use Bayesian, we need to use some type of technologies or techniques like the Markov chain. Monte Carlo technique of some, or some type of approximation like, like the Laplace approximation. But anyway, uh, packages nowadays can help us to, to solve these kind of problems. Other classical problem in ALM is about to model uh, the outflows of non-maturity deposits. And it's quite difficult because sometimes in, in the financial institutions, there are not enough data to model this type of behavior. And it's not only thing, it's not, it's not the only thing that we can model regarding these non-maturity deposits. We can also try to model the inflows and or to try to model the the new coming uh, clients or the or the or the clients that are leaving the institution. But for for a simple for a simple model, just keep uh, we just want to keep the outflows. Uh, this is like the uh, aging, uh, is aging analysis. It's, it's a very common practice in, in banking. And it's to go and take the history of a course, course of, the, of the outflows of our clients. And then what we are going to do is to try to separate the problem again with clustering and try to mo model every cluster uh, separately. So what we're going to do is to try to make a proxy customized for every type of client. And <clears throat> one of the things I want to tell you in the practice uh, in a few minutes is going to be the use of autoencoders. So imagine that we have already our group of clients that we want to model the outflows of the non-maturity deposits. And we have this group of people. What we're going to do is we're going to take the market data and with an autoencoder, we're going to compress the information. As I told you, with one of these uh, techniques of compressing information. And for each of these groups, we're going to use this information and the variables that really are important for that group. And then with a classical regressor, we're going to try to predict the, the percentage of the outflow. What are classical techniques like linear regressions, ARIMAs, state space models are very uh, things that you can see in practice. But also we can try new things like decision trees, long short, long short term memory architectures. This is a deep learning architecture or convolutional nets, also another type of architectures. And we can try again with the Bayesian regression. Another uh, another uh, common problem in, in ALM is about trying to predict the new volume uh, that is coming to the financial institution, these new clients, so we can try to predict the, the new business. Most of the time, the most important features are going to be macroeconomical features, and we can apply again some time of filtering. This is like a very important technique. And we can apply uh, this technique just to improve the, the common techniques that we can apply here is the linear regression or a Bayesian regression. So as you can as you can notice, what I'm trying to tell you is that it's not so important about applying new techniques to 
to substitute the, the, the model that we already have in production. What we can try to use is the machine learning or to make the, to make the life easier for our analysis or for our uh, thinking process, okay? And I wanted to tell you uh, about a last uh, problem. Maybe this one is like more science fiction. Uh, again, I'm going to call my friend the octopus and what I'm going to do is to take uh, three portfolios. One portfolio is going to be built of loans like a level type of loans, level schedule. The other portfolio is going to be a bonds, like coupon zero bonds. And the last portfolio is going to be a, a mission, is, issue of debt, for example, a bonds too. And what we are going to try is to uh, replicate the decisions that we made uh, in ALM about liquidity. How to do that? Well, well, what we have to do here is to apply something called uh, the Bellman equation. And this equation is going to help us to calculate a, a function that's going to be optimized and is based on a, the reward, the future rewards that we, we can have from our environment. The, the reward in our, in our case could be like a equity value or it could be also like the margin of our products or it could be um, it could be also like a, a regulatory, regulatory uh, ratio. It doesn't have to be like profit always, okay? It can be other type of reward. And if we train this agent, this agent has to be trained with a lot of data. And that's a very difficult thing to do, to find data to train this type of models because it's about finding the best parameters of neural nets, of complex neural nets. Uh, we can do something very, very smart and it's try to simulate the environment. That means to try to model the environment instead of model the agent. And what we can do here is to take all of these products and the, with the classic passive check or the whole white models, uh, try to replicate synthetic data. And then what we can do is to lift this model into a machine. Uh, we can lift this uh, agent work for for months or for weeks and try to learn how to handle this portfolio. So I wanted to give you some heuristics. I think it's very important to have some heuristics before trying to start model uh, machine learning in ALM. The best uh, heuristic, and is going to be the most important one, is that if you're going to try to model something with financial data, is try to do it with an expert. Try to do it with someone that really understands the domain, because if you are a data scientist and you don't have any clue about the market or about the, the risk management, it's going to be very difficult. And the, sec the second one is that uh, there are techniques in machine learning that doesn't have to be about prediction. It can be used uh, for clustering, for compressing information, for filtering information, and maybe those type of uh, practices is going to be easier and it's going to be even more useful. <clears throat> and here I listed more more heuristics and I hope that you you can read them uh, carefully and and I hope that you like this this presentation. So the next step is going to to go with the practical part. I don't know if this is possible to have a two minutes of a break. So sharing my screen. All right. I wanted I want to start with the practical part. <clears throat> Uh, 
Can you see my screen? You can see the screen, Sergio. You had a question here. Are yeah. you able to take questions? Uh, yes, of course, of course. So what are the techniques rep recommended to generate the synthetic data that Sergio has been successfully applying? And can, can you please comment if they are domain or problem specific? Yes, yes. It's, it's quite difficult. Uh, I mean, I, I can answer this question with a practical part because I'm going to I'm going to general to gener with an autoencoder. I'm going to show you how to generate this synthetic data. But the idea is to apply a variational uh, technique, and what it tries to do is to uh, with a convolutional net or with a LSTM neural net is to compress information. It's difficult. It's very difficult. Uh, sometimes it's not going to be successful uh, if you put too much uh, parameters, and if you if you use earlier parameters, it's going to be similar to the Nelson scale model because uh, the results is going to be a kind of the type of factors of the level and shift and, uh, and cur curvature. Is there other uh, question? There is no way. <laughs> We've started something now. So, there's another one, uh, which is. Oh, these are coming through to me in support. Uh, it's very, yes, yeah, so it's an informative presentation and we're going to provide the underlying research papers and presentation material. Certainly the, it's everything's being recorded here, guys. So um, you'll, you'll get that. Uh, yes, there'll be a replay. Shall uh, I hand back to you, Sergi, so you can carry on with your lecture? All right, perfect. Can you see my screen, right? Can you see the the collab, the collaboratory area, yes. right? Yes. Okay, perfect. So uh, Google has this amazing service that uh, we can use to play a little bit with the coding, and it's for free, so you can do it if you want to. I'm going to go very slowly, and you can try to use this uh, to do the same as I'm going to do. All right. So what the, the first thing I'm going to do is to load some information. I'm going to load some interest rates information. And then what we're going to do is to load a, a very important package. It's a very nice tool and it's the pandas. The pandas is a very powerful uh, uh, it's a powerful library because it helps us to to work with tables. I mean, are called data frames, but it's a very good, very good, uh, and very powerful tool, right? The other one is the NumPy. NumPy uh, is going to help us uh, using arrays and 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 apply calculation to those arrays. Are very, it's also very nice. And that's it, okay? I'm going to load information in a data frame from pandas, all right? Let me take a look to the data. It's going to be just one column, so I'm going to separate it, separate it. And also I'm going to give it some format to the data because I have here a date, so I need to be careful with the dates.
I'm going to use a function, a lambda function to do that. And daytime has also a very nice library to work with, a, with dates. Let's give it a format. In this case, it's going to be a days, months, and year. And the last thing I would like to do is to use a, the double or the floating type of information for the numbers. And to do this is with the D types. So let's take a look to the data here. A second, please. There's something that is not doing. <clears throat> Why is that? Just complaining about the date. Okay. Right now. Working. Um, I think there is an issue with the separator. It's not comma. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you so much. All right, yeah. Ah. Swing to float. It's curious because it's quite easier here. Anyway, I'm going to keep with this one, and if I have problems, I'm going to come back. Okay, so let me find this like a row date. It's like a row what right here. Let me try to wow. I see. okay. Let me try to plot it. Maybe it's going to. But before plotting it, let me set an index that is going to column dates. I don't want to have problem problem with this column. Okay, let me take a look to the data. I hope that it's going to look pretty. Ah, it looks pretty. I mean, it's not perfect, but it looks good. So let me plot some Instagrams, some histograms, sorry. <laughs> okay, they look awful. That's, that's good because it's about prices. Now I'm going to do is to uh, erase some memory from the prices. That's I mean, it's not it's it's not the best practice, but just to take a look if it looks good or not. It should look it should look like more Gaussian. Yeah, it looks more Gaussian. Okay, that's good. But for this model, what we're going to do is uh, to use an autoencoder. An autoencoder is like this uh, picture here. What it does is try to com to compress information with the encoder, and uh, then later we're going to decompress the information. So we're going to, the last part is going to keep this little thing here with the information compressed. So the input is going to be the, the, the data mark, the market data. And, the, and the, the, the thing that we want to estimate or the thing that we want to target is also the same, the same input. So it's like a, an unsupervised uh, model and we can use the we can we can use this part later to make a predictions okay so how to how to do this we are going to use a very very nice 
API that it works with TensorFlow as a backend. TensorFlow help us with deep learning. And Keras is just like an API to make everything more easier. So it's a, it's a pretty thing. I'm going to import one of the models. It's going to be the sequential. So this model is it's like it's, it's like building uh, it's like cooking a lasagna because we're going to have like layers. And I wanted to have here like a more detailed architecture. It's not easy to understand, but it's also like the the, the encoder part, the decoder part, and we are going to build like these uh, layers in the decoder in the in the in, in the part of the encoder and part of the decoder too. So let me show you how to do this. It's a sequential model. And we are going to put the first layer of the, it's going to be the first layer to the lasagna. So I'm going to add just one layer. It's going to be a unit of one type of the uh, most used architectures in sequential uh, sequential uh, forecasting, and is the long short-term memory uh, architecture. I wanted to have a picture here about this. It's a little bit complex and it has a lot of parameters, but what it tries to do is to try to memorize things and to forget things that are not important. So it's like it's a it's a very interesting idea. So I'm going to use one of these uh, architectures to put one unit. I'm going to keep it simple first with one unit only. Also, I want to put a name. It's going to be the decoder one. And a, I want to define the, the input shape. When we talk about a deep learning, the type of information or the type of format for that information is going to be like, a, it's going to depend a lot about, in, it's going to be a lot uh, it's going to depend a lot of the type of, of model. In this case, this model requires a shape that is, is going to be three-dimensional, like a tensor. That's, then, that's why the, the main library is called TensorFlow. It's because it works with tensors. And tensors are like uh, several, dimension, uh, several dimensional uh, formats or structures of the data, okay? And this case is going to have like three dimensions. And also, I'm going to use a, I'm going to take a look to the architecture. And there is a very interesting thing that is the summary. Uh, Sir here. Uh, yeah. Hi, this is, this is John. Um, we had a question come in. Now's a good time. Um, Summit has asked, uh, like, what are these rates? Are they 3M LIBOR rates uh, with diff maturities? I'm not sure if that applies right now. Sorry, I've just, just joined and taken over from Michael. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. It's, <laughs> uh, it's important, I guess. It's important. Different tenors of interest rates. Okay, and this is the evolution in time of those tenors. Perfect. I'm sure that's helped. Thanks. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be something in particular. Okay, it doesn't have to be LIBOR. It's just an example. Okay, but the idea, as you can see, the the evolution is very, it's like very natural, right? Like very low on the last uh, year. Okay. Now, uh, let me. I want to plot the model too. This, there is a nice feature here to plot models. It's cool. I'm going to use it too. I want to show you how the models looks like.
Okay, perfect. And now it's coming the tricky part of everything that is to give the right shape to the things, to the input. Because we, if we want to fit this uh, architecture, we need, we need to, to create this three-dimensional shape. And this is a little bit tricky. Um, I'm sure that I'm going to have some books, but anyway, I, I'm going to show you how to do it. So the first thing I'm going to say is I'm going to take a look to the shape of the data. And I'm going to keep a, only two features. We can put more features. I, it's not, it doesn't have to be two, but to keep it simple, I'm going to leave only two overnight and three months tenors. <clears throat> and I'm going to transform this data in a three-dimensional thing. How to do this? I have a, I have a function and support function here. Support tools. Okay, and tools has a trick. I'm going to apply a trick here. I'm going to calculate the divisors of this number. Uh, it's not very pretty. I can try with a different one. So I'm going to, to keep with the 512. <clears throat> and I'm trying to find three numbers that uh, multiplied are going to give this number. Okay, so I'm going to keep the first 512 data. And I'm going to find three numbers. Let me call them batch is going to be the first one. The second one is going to be the number of steps. I'm going to tell you what does that mean. And the last one is going to be the number of features. Number of features, yeah. The number of features, we know already that there are two. The number of steps is going to be the sequence the, because we have to give the information to the neural net in batches and each batch has to have a length. So it's like this three-dimensional architecture. The first is going to be the number of batches or the number of samples. Then each sample has to have like a long hit, a, long, a, a, a number of steps. And the last one is going to be the number of features. In this case, it's going to be 64. And in this case, it's going to be eight. All right. Okay, thank you. Let me transform this into an array of NumPy with the shape required. Shape. It's going to be a batch, number of steps, and number of features. Okay. It looks fine. As you can see, this is like a three-dimensional array from NumPy, and it's going to be the food that our, our architecture is going to have, our neural net. I'm going to call this the X. Perfect. All right. This anymore? All right. So let me define the shape. The first layer, <clears throat> we can define the shape. It it doesn't have to be necessary, but it's always useful to define correctly <laughs> the shape in the first layer. It's going to be the number of steps and the number of features. And let's take a look to the architecture. This, this is like the simplest architecture we can build. And we have here our decoder, that is our first layer. We got, we're going to put <clears throat> a more layers to this decoder. I'm going to use like two layers. How to do this? Just I'm going to copy one layer and paste it like again, change the name. We are not going to need 
a, a input shape. And what we are going to do is to request for the previous layer <clears throat> to return all the values of for each unit. In our case, we just have one unit, it's not so important, but if we had here like three units, we are requesting to get three numbers from this layer. And now, if I show you the architecture again, the output of the last layer is going to be the compressed information. Now let me let me build the the encoder part. It's going to be totally symmetrical, so it's as easy as to copy this. And to copy this one too. Right. Input shape is not necessary here, but it's necessary to have a return <coughs> sequence. That's an important part. And let's change the name to this is incorrect. This is the encoder, encoder, decoder, decoder. Okay, this is like totally symmetrical. That's perfect. It's not going to work if I don't, I mean, there is a problem here is that this layer is going to look for a, a number of units. Um, in case that we change these numbers here, I want to put it a little bit more flexible. So I'm going to repeat the last output from this layer so that I can give that output to the next layer. This is not, not so important, but I have to do it. It's going to add the following thing is called repeat vector. And this is going to have the number of steps. <clears throat> As you can see, the coding is not difficult. The coding is quite easy. The important part is to, it's like to handle these shapes and to handle the dimension. That's, that's a little bit tricky. And it requires to have very clear the type of thing that we are talking about. Anyway, I have done this example several times so that I know what I have to do. So it's not a big deal. Okay. Now let me compile it. Okay. So do, do you remember that I, I show you the steps for the recipe of training a model? And two of the most important ingredients of this recipe is the loss function and the optimizer. And I'm going to define the optimizer and the loss function for this model. The optimizer, uh, let me take the famous, this one is the famous, and the loss function. Is going to be. I'm going to put them down square ever. There are other parameters, of course, that can be interesting, but <clears throat> for now, I'm going to keep this. This is the simplest one. And now I'm going to try to in the his the history of the of the training. It doesn't appear. Okay. So I have to define the input. It's going to be the X. I have to define the output. It's going to be the same X because this is an unsupervised algorithm. Also, uh, we need to define the batch size. I already defined it in the batch variable. 
the number of uh, times that the the model is going to to see all the data is called the epochs. Could be, for example, four hundred. And also, it's very important the validation validation split. So we are going to take the 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 market data and to split in in in, in two pieces, twenty percent for out of sample and eighty percent for in sample. And the last thing I'm going to do, and is is also like important, is to put the shuffle as false. I mean, you can the shuffle is to take the input data and to shuffle it. If we do it with sequential data, <clears throat> I mean, uh, it's maybe not the best idea because we're going to break the autocorrelations of, of the things. I'm going to save this in a variable and to run it. Of course, it's going to complain like always. About dimensions, and it's because it's missing something important. Uh, let me explain to you why it's complaining. The output is a is like a three dimensional structure, and it's expecting two features. <clears throat> Remember that we are trying to replicate the two tenors, and it's getting three. So we are going to do is to try to reduce the information to only two with a multiplication of two matrices. And it is done with something called time distributed distributed layer. And to do that, I'm going to put it here. <clears throat> I'm going to add this time distributed layer. Thanks. The number of features. And let's take a look to the architecture. All right. Here we have like the two. But you can see that there is like only two now, right? It should work now. So it's trading. Uh, let me plot the last function uh, from matplotlib. Matplotlib port is called pyplot. And what we are going to do is use the plot function from pyplot. Storia. This one is called um, plus, and let me name it as training. Good. I plot. Uh, check. Hmm. What's wrong now? So you can see that this is going down, right? And what do you think is good? Or do you think that, that this, if this is going to be my first lasagna, is going to taste good? It's not working well. And I'm going to show you why. If I plot the other part of the, of the problem, that is the validation loss, I'm going to call this a variation. Oh, do you see that it makes like a very strange thing? It's because it's not it's not doing well. The validation loss should be above the 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 training loss. Yeah. So is is what I'm trying to show you here is that this this what you are going to try to um, 
train and model, you have to have some knowledge about the reality. And not only that, you have to, to try many things because these models are very sensitive. Now, I want to show you the sensitivity of these things. Let me take, for example, uh, the last layer, and I'm going to change the nonlinearity. I mean, the activation function that is that gives the nonlinearity to the model. To use the activation, another famous one is the ReLU. And let's take a look. Meanwhile, let me take a look where what I'm doing here wrong. Hmm. Now you're working. Thank you. And type uh, the type. Yeah. Load. Thank you. Yeah, that's the one I like. Anyway, uh, let's take a look to the losses. Ah, horrible. Let me try to overfit it like crazy. Let's keep it a lot. Let's try to, no, it's too much. Maybe 1,000, um, put a lot, let me put a lot of, so it memorizes, ha, ha, ha. I want to overfit it a lot. Maybe it's going to change. Um, let me change the type of optimizer. No, it's okay. This is the last try, okay? So it's about a plane. I, 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 as you can see, it's not difficult to code and you can play a lot with this. It, it took me 20 minutes with some practice or 30 minutes to do it. If the first time, the first time you're going to take maybe two or three hours, it depends on the experience you're going to have with the Python. It's not very difficult, okay? So. It's just to follow the recipe that I told you. But again, it's like cooking. The first time is going to be disaster. Something interesting that we can try too is that if you remember with the Nelson Siegel model, uh, you can calculate like the shift and the you can calculate like the curvature and the slope, uh, uh, making a difference between tenors, right? So we can do something similar here. We can try to calculate the difference between two tenors, and we can use that to try to build this autoencoder. And then what we are going to do is to keep the the encoder part, the encoder. I always say it incorrectly, this is the encoder. We can keep the encoder and use that encoder to build an autoregressive model to predict. It's like a second step. Now let me plot this and we are done with the example and it, it looks horrible, okay? So it's not, it's not that easy, all right? So I'm done with the practice. I don't know if there are any questions I can try to resolve. Uh, maybe could you could you explain better again uh, the um, the repeat vectors and yeah why we need yeah. to repeat the vectors in between the encoder and the coder ah the repeat vector yeah yeah, yeah. that's that's thanks okay I don't know there's a lot of light here I don't know if you can see the diagram here but uh, let me try to do it there's like like two blue blue squares here this is like the output and maybe it's going to be easier here wait yeah here's perfect 
this is going to be the output of the last layer of the encoder. And as you can see, it's going to have four uh, units. So it's going to be a variable with four positions. So in order to go to the next layer, we need to put, we need to repeat. Let me show you how to, we need to take the, the, last, uh, the last unit and to repeat the information so we can go give it to the next layer. But it's not, it's really like, it's really not so important. It's just to keep the, to make that the architecture to function, to work. It's not going to give a, any information, this layer okay. here. Okay, thanks. So, but it is mirrored, basically. It's the mirror. This is the, 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 the first, let me put it here. Sorry. Let me put it here like this. This is the encoder. So this is where the encoder ends. And the output of this last layer is going to be one unit, the value of one unit. And this is the compressed information. But unfortunately, we cannot give that information to the next layer, just, just one, because it requires the same, it requires like more, more positions. That's why we repeat we repeat one unit, we repeat the only one information several times, the number of steps. Because this this let me I'm going to know I, I know how to going to explain it better. Um, ah no, in the same presentation. Wait. <clears throat> Let me show you my, my presentation again. I will explain from there. Mm. Can you see my my screen with my yes yes my thanks okay perfect so here you can see there is like a an architecture of a LSTM something similar to this one but less less detail okay each of these circles is a unit this these are like this these complex things are called units with a lot of parameters inside. And, uh, the input is here, is here, this is the input. So to the last, uh, the, the last layer of the encoder is, give, is going to give us only one number, but the next layer is going to require several steps. So we're going to repeat the same yeah. and give it to the, to the next layer. This is the- Thanks a lot, layer. thanks a lot. Really, now I understood. Thank you. Is there anything else I can I can answer? Maybe Sergio, you can introduce yourself that you didn't do it at the beginning. Yes, yes, of course, of course. Uh, I am responsible for the core logics of our uh, ALM um, engine. And uh, also I do, I like to give support everything related to math or uh, any type of statistical uh, knowledge applied to any type of problems in, in our company. Hi, are you able to visualize the output of the encoder? Yes, you can do it too. Thank you. Um, basically, the, 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 the output of the encoder is going to be just like the output of this layer, okay? It's basically that. So I, I think this uh, we are uh, finished, right? With the I don't have anything else to show to you. 
There is only one part I didn't show you, and maybe uh, for some people would be interesting. Um, for further uh, reading, for everyone that is inter interested in our in our uh, application of machine learning, and is the following. I, I I I leave some annexes in the presentation that I usually don't don't show to the people, but I think could be important. The one that is that there are several theorems that say that you can approximate any function with neural nets, with particular neural nets. This is a very important theorem. Also that there are techniques that are going to help us uh, to explain better the mechanisms behind a, a complex a neural nets. And these mechanisms, you can, you can, find, um, you can find examples how to use it. It's, also very practical. And there's also a very important part that I didn't talk about, that is the, co the co causation and dependence. Uh, in finance, it's, very, it's a very interesting topic to, to understand what is the hidden mechanisms between variables. And I hope that you enjoyed the presentation. And if there is any other question, uh, you can contact us and I'll be happy to respond. Uh, excuse me, um, if I can have a question. Regarding the uh, reinforcement learning, that should be the frontier of the machine learning. Uh, did you have uh, successful stories to some successful example to where did you use uh, this technique? Because I know it is very uh, difficult to apply, but um, I, I have mean, not done uh, exper um, experiences. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for example, let me give you, if you talk about trade trading, I don't know if you're familiar with the trading practices. I try to build a model and keep it uh, trading for like four weeks and it didn't work well. I lost like in a demo account, like a uh, $100 in just one day or something like that. And I realized that in order to, to make it work, we have to do something similar as, as I, I presented here. And it's try to replicate the environment with models that are already working and just leave very precise a environment so that the model really can learn from that model. It has to be, you have to help it a lot. For example, in, trade, in trading, maybe we can try to help it to just tackle one port in part of the trading side, like sizing process, the, the bed sizing process, or a, but we need to help it. You cannot give it just like data because you're not going to learn market data at least without a, any type of filtering. I don't know if, if I answered the question correctly. Uh, sort of, yes, yes. Yeah. You need a, enough data basically, and all kind of data, yeah. You need a lot also, of data, but, but when you don't have data, what you have to do is start to narrow the domain of the problem so that the agent is going to learn only just a little part of the domain, hmm. basically to help it. For example, you can build a different models that you know that it's going to work, for example, bed sizing problem or the, uh, the where to put the, the take profit uh, price. And what we have to do is to try that the model, the agent only take decisions over those models. But I mean, we have to like to help a lot the model because financial data changes a lot with time. So it's very difficult mm -hmm. to just train something without helping it. Thanks, thanks a lot. I think that's how maybe we can finish the session. Well, okay, uh, thank you much, everyone.